Good morning again, and happy Founders Day. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, didn't we just celebrate Founders Day? I know, it's an easy mistake. We just celebrated Foundation Day. Okay, real quick, Foundation Day is the anniversary of the consecration of Archbishop Bates as the first archbishop or the first bishop in the Charismatic Episcopal Church. Founders Day. I'm sorry, Archbishop Adler, excuse me. Sorry. Um, my bad. The, um, whoops. Um, now, <laughs> derailed in the first 30 seconds. Um, back on track. Founders Day is the anniversary of Church of the Messiah becoming a con uh, congregation. All right? So, Foundation Day, anniversary of the beginning of the Charismatic Episcopal Church, Founders Day, beginning of Church of the Messiah. I know names are very similar, but as so, so often is the case, nobody asked me about either name, which is reasonable because at the time I was like 17 years old. The only thing people were asking me at the time was, where's your homework? And what time are you going to be home? So... It, it makes sense that no one asked me. So what are you going to do? And so also, at the time, I wasn't asked about the name Church of the Messiah. I wasn't asked because I wasn't even a part of the congregation, much less a part of the group that decided on the name. And I didn't get any kind of input on that because, again, I was... A snot-nosed little teenager. So nobody would have asked me, and they would have been right not to ask me. So I don't really know what the founding vision was. But this whole summer, God's been sort of dealing with me on going back to the vision, and the original vision, both of the CEC and this congregation. And going back to the, the original idea, and going back to the basics, and the original idea and what it means to be the charismatic Episcopal church and what it means to be church of the messiah so in my prayer time and in my reflection time i i went back to what it means to be church of the messiah and as i wasn't there i can only pray and reflect about what i think that means and so Here's what my reflections have taken me to in that. Okay, so we know, or at least some of us do, many of this is who we all have, some of, the, some of you this is new information, but Messiah is the Jewish word for the anointed one. It's the same word in Hebrew, which translated into Greek, we get Christ, right? Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. It's the word which we get chrism, which is oil, and Messiah is literally the one who is anointed with oil. Now, as charismatics, we like to talk about the anointing, right? We like to talk about when the anointing falls and the spirit comes, and typically when charismatics talk about the anointing hit, and they talk about that's when, that's when the miracles hit, right? That's when... When the anointing falls, that's when people start falling back and going out in the spirit, and that's when the good stuff starts happening, right? If you know what I mean. But the anointing, in the Old Testament point of view, is literally when you pour oil over somebody's head, and you literally anoint them with oil. And the Messiah is the anointed one. He's the one who gets anointed with oil. And in the Old Testament, there were three kinds of people who were anointed with oil. And Jesus, as the Messiah, embodies those three kinds of people. And as we are the church of the Messiah, we represent him... And I think we ought to represent those three kinds of people that he embodies. Now, those three kinds of people 
are prophets, priests, and kings. And Jesus is the embodiment of the prophet, priest, and king. Now, because today is a special day, you are going to have a real special occurrence. I'm going to do a three-point sermon. <laughs> point one, prophet. Point two, priest. Point three, king. That's our three points. Start your outline. So, what does it mean for us to be prophetic people? Well, what are prophets? Well, thank God we're not doing a Bible study on this because we'd be here for about six days because there's only about half of the Old Testament that is prophetic, right? But prophets are the ones who speak forth the word of God. They're not necessarily ones who tell the future, although sometimes they do. But what's more important than them telling the future is speaking forth the word of God. Now, sometimes that is in a way that they have access to information that they might not otherwise have, as in when they're speaking forth a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom by the grace of the Holy Spirit, but other times it's by the grace of their discipline to read the word of God and to know his truth. So sometimes you get a mystical prophetic word where somebody is speaking forth the word of God prophetically as in like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah or any of the 12 minor prophets. And other times it's when you get somebody who is immersed in the word of God and they speak the truth. And somebody like Father Terry Gensimer, who's dedicated his whole life to the preborn. That is a prophetic word that goes forth. And it may not be something that is a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, but is prophetic nonetheless. We're called to speak forth God's word. And we can see this in some place like Ezekiel chapter 37, where Ezekiel goes to the valley of dry bones and God says, speak to the dry bones. Speak life to these bones. We're called to do that. We're called to go to a lost and dying world, a world that is dry and barren, and speak life to them. Sometimes, by God's grace, he gives us a miraculous word to speak, and sometimes it's just because we know his word, because we studied scripture. But that's what it means for us as the church of the Messiah to be messianic. And to speak forth in that role. Now, Jesus is prophet, Jesus is priest, Jesus is king. So we are called to be prophet, priest, and king. So we are called to be priestly. Now, some of you think, oh, he's talking to the black shirts and the white robes. But no, we are all a chosen priesthood. A royal nation. St. Peter, in his first letter, says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. I heard an incredible sermon once. And clergy hear sermons all the time. They remember none of them. If a, if a priest remembers a sermon, it is a glorious moment. I remember a sermon where someone said that at an ordination, the priest becomes the sacrament because he is the sign of God's grace working through the people because he is that reminder to the people that God's grace moves through them. Because it's not just, here's this guy who's going to do this stuff. But this guy doing this stuff is a reminder that that's what you are supposed to do. Because what he does up there, you are supposed to do. Because he goes up there and he lifts up bread and wine and your money. 
And that's important. That's miraculous. But you are supposed to offer your whole lives. St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, Walk in love as Christ has also loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice for, to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Jesus gave himself as an offering, and we're supposed to do the same. We are supposed to give ourselves as an offering. Again, the priest lifts up the bread and the wine, and then he calls you to lift up your hearts, lift up yourselves as an offering to God. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul says, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is, according to one translation, your priestly duty. Right? So the priest is up there as a reminder, not that, hey, you get out of this, but this is your job. We are an icon of what you're supposed to do. We wear the white robes, not so we can cut back on laundry expenses, but as a reminder that you will all wear this in heaven. We were once in a homeschool program, not the one we're in right now, where someone poked fun at my children because their dad wore a dress in church. I said, don't worry, tell their dads when they get to heaven, I'll show them how to put theirs on. I don't think they said that, but <laughs> we are icons and reminders of what you are called to do. You are called to offer what you have up to God, the good and the bad. You're called to offer your fears, your anxieties, your troubles, your perils, your addictions, your fears. Lay those on the altar and let God take them. Let him consume them. He will trade them for his holiness and his righteousness and his strength. Offer to God what you have and he will give you what he is. Again, Jesus is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. So we are called to act as kings. But remember that Jesus came not to lord his authority over people. So if we're not called to be lords over people, how are we called to live out our kingly role? What does that mean? Well, why did Israel first want a king? They wanted someone to fight their battles for them. In the first book of Samuel, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, no, we will have a king over us that we may be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out and fight our battles. Kings fight battles for their people. And we also know what brought David down? The issue that brought David down was the so-called Bathsheba gate. Because in the last 20 years, any scandal ends in gate, right? Because, of course, that's just the way of things now. But if we look... At 2 Samuel chapter 11, we know that it wasn't just that he had his issue with Bathsheba. The issue was that he forsook his duty. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants out with him in all Israel. But David remained at Jerusalem. In the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle... David sent everybody out to battle, but he remained in Jerusalem. He was supposed to go out and fight battles. And he stayed home. 
And look what trouble he got into. Because kings go out and fight battles. Now we also know the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual for casting down idols and casting down strongholds. We're not going to go out and fight like the world fights. We're not going to go out to the local bar and pick a fight, as satisfying as that might be. Did I say that out loud? Whoops. We're not going to go on Facebook and pick fights, are we? He says to himself. We're going to put on the whole armor of God. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in this present darkness. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the evil of this day and having done all to stand. Stand. Because when we're called to fight, we're not called to go out and pick fights and win arguments. We're called to battle in the spirit. We're called to fight against the enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you can't beat anybody else's flesh. You can only war against your own flesh. But you can war against the devil. And you can fight against the world and the spirit. And we're called to wage battles against the enemy. We're called to pick up that banner and go. In the early days of the CEC, there was a movie that was incredibly popular. And I know you're all thinking what movie I'm going to, but you're wrong. I'm going to Henry V. And everyone went, what? No, it's Henry V. Because in Henry V, there is this incredibly famous historical battle called the Battle of Agincourt. And in the Battle of Agincourt, it took place on the eve of the Feast of St. Crispin. And the English were about to get slaughtered by the French as the strategists believed. Now, there was some things that were going on that made the battle go 100% differently than the strategists assumed. But on the night before the English assumed they were all going to die, Henry V, the king, walked out in disguise among his people. And he realized that they all thought they were going to die. And he gets up and he gives this speech and it was such a good speech, as Shakespeare writes it, that the people became so encouraged that they went out and they fought this incredible battle and they slaughtered the French. It was an overwhelming massacre. And that speech became known as the St. Crispin's Day speech. It's amazing when Shakespeare writes a speech, it's really, really well done. But when the king goes out and he gives a speech under his own banner, everyone rallies. And we're called to remember that as we find in the Song of Solomon, his banner over us is love. And when we understand that he loves us and that he loves us so much that he sends his son to die for us. That he loved us so much that even when we were sinners and when we hated him, he sent his son to die for us. We begin to trust in him. We have hope in him. We can have that confidence in him. We grow in our faith, in our hope, in our love. And we begin to have what the world lacks and desperately needs. And that's what we're called to do. Both as Church of the Messiah and as the Charismatic Episcopal Church. That's what we're called to do. That's my idea of the founding vision of the church. I don't know if it's what they had in mind. But when I look back and I see Church of the Messiah... I think of what it means to be people of the Messiah. 
The people gathered together under that name. It means we're people who live out that role. We live out that role to speak his word prophetically. To speak forth the word of God. Whether we do it because we know the truth or we're speaking it out prophetically by a word of knowledge or word of wisdom or a gift of the spirit. We offer ourselves continuously because that's what we're called to do. And we fight battles for the soul of this world because that's what we're called to be as kings. Because God has given us the spirit of sonship and if we're sons, then we're heirs. And if he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, then he's made us kings with him. And that's what we're called to do. And that is how we are called to live out being members of this church. And that is a challenge. Because it is a hard call. It's not just we sit around and, and come to church and have social hours here and there. It is a challenge. May God give each and every one of us the grace to live it out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hey, this is Father Scott Luckman with Church of Messiah. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, please click the like button below. And also, you can click the subscribe button to get notifications in your inbox when we post other videos in the future. You can click the little bell below and you'll get uh, notifications also. So do that and uh, we'd appreciate it. So thanks. God bless you. We appreciate it. Uh, pray for us and we'll be praying for you. God bless you.